Okay, um, we're doing a big adventure with Jesus off the map, uh, looking at John and how John has uh, walked with Jesus now uh, for two or three years. And what I want to talk about this morning is, is John's big weekend. And I hope that some of us will have a big weekend with Jesus next weekend on our away weekend. I'm convinced that that's going to happen. But I want... You know, whether you're coming on the away weekend or not, everyone needs a weekend like this. It may not be in a weekend, but everyone needs these things to happen uh, to you as part of your spiritual adventure with Jesus. I wonder when you last had an amazing weekend on your spiritual adventure with Jesus. So let me set the scene. It's Friday. It's Friday, the beginning of the weekend. John is, is feeling rotten. He's feeling rotten because last night he went to sleep when he should be awake. And as a result of that, he hasn't slept a, week, a wink since. And uh, here's a photo of him uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, sleeping while Jesus was praying. And uh, I don't know if we can have it on this screen as well. That would be clever. Uh, the rumors were that Judas had committed suicide. John had been around Peter when Peter had denied Jesus the night before. And, and, and John had been in the sort of shadows and hadn't run off when Peter had run. Uh, but John were, was there when Jesus was arrested. He was there when Jesus was on trial. He'd seen the horrors of the miscarriage of justice. He'd seen the crowd turn on him. Maybe he'd been in that crowd and wondered what was happening when people started calling out, crucify him, crucify him. John had followed at a distance when the Lord had carried the cross up the Via Della Rosa, up to the place of the skull. And there he had seen the Romans put the nails through his wrists. He'd seen Jesus' back against the cross and the blood from the scourging and the whipping pouring down. He'd seen Jesus lifted up on the cross and hung out to be crucified. And John is there looking at Jesus. And the star sky starts to turn dark. And with all the feelings in his heart about what has happened over the last 12 hours, John sees in the eyes of Jesus and, on the, and in the way that Jesus is exposed to the world, what John sees is the purest love he has ever seen. So much so that when he writes about it later, he can say, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That's John 3.16. When he writes to the churches in 1 John 3, 16, he says, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ has laid down his life for us. Many Christians have seen in that horrible, ghastly scene at Golgotha, many Christians have seen the wrath of of God there. I don't think John saw the wrath of God when he was looking at Jesus' face on the cross at Golgotha. He saw the wrath of the people spitting at Jesus. He'd seen the anger of the Romans and the sadistic pleasure they were getting as they were nailing him to the cross. He'd seen the wrath of the crowd as they bade, crucify him, crucify him. That was the wrath that he'd seen. But as he looks at Jesus, he sees the love of God. This is how we know that God loves us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Some people have seen the justice of God at the cross. You might have heard that. I'm not sure that that's what John saw at all. What he saw was the injustice. He'd watched Pilate wash his hands 
of this innocent man who he betrayed, who he condemned to be crucified. He saw the injustice of someone being declared innocent and then handed over to be crucified. He saw the injustice of one who seemed only to love and to care and to bless now find himself the victim of being aggressively abused and tortured and crucified. John doesn't see justice that he sees injustice. What he sees is love. He sees the wrath of human beings. He sees the injustice of the system. But he sees the love of God poured out at the cross. What a Friday. And as John looks into the eyes of Jesus, as John sees the arms of Jesus outstretched, he knows God loves me. As he contemplates it all in 1 John chapter 4, he writes, God is love. Because he has an encounter with the love of God at the cross. And here in the greatest demonstration of selfless love that the world has ever known, there are a few things that accompany The love of God. Because love never travels alone, does it? Love never happens in isolation. There's always some things that accompany love. Whether that's joy or peace or commitment or faithfulness or whatever. And here at the cross, the love of God is accompanied by forgiveness. As Jesus speaks forgiveness for those who are crucifying him. He says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they are doing. The centurion receives that forgiveness. And the Ro- some of the Roman soldiers who'd so viciously put Jesus to death receive that forgiveness. And some of the crowd who'd been spitting on him and mocking him receive that forgiveness. And 50 days later, a whole crowd of people whom Peter said, you with the help of wicked men put Jesus to death, but God has raised him from the dead. They found forgiveness. And the whole city was turned the right way up because people found forgiveness. Because they'd seen something of the love of God at the cross on that Friday as John looked into the eyes of Jesus. John has an experience of the love of God that means that he knows that he's forgiven. He has an experience of the love of God where he finds family. He finds family. Jesus calls out from the cross, hey John. Your mom. Mary, your son. John tells us from that time on, Mary moved into John's house. I don't know what Zebedee thought. I don't know what John's, mom, John's wife, I mean, I don't know what she thought. What, another one to cook for? I have no idea. I, I mean, maybe John lived in a studio flat on his own and there was hardly enough room. I have no idea. But that from that time on, Because John finds family at the cross. There's a great Christian tradition, isn't there, of finding family at the cross. Because of the cross, we're sisters and brothers in Christ. Together, children, together of the Lord God, our Father who's loved us and testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And so as brothers and sisters, we care for each other. We love one another. We look out for each other. As brothers and sisters in Christ, we, we, we... encourage one another we bear one another's burdens we we help one another as an extended family of people we care for each other so that when john writes 1 john 3 16 says this is how we know what love is jesus christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters John gets that at the cross. This Friday encounter with Jesus and his love. John sees Jesus die. Really die. He makes a point in the Gospels that the soldiers come to 
break Jesus' legs to make sure that he dies before the Saturday starts at sunset. But it doesn't need to happen because Jesus is already dead. These death merchants know a faint from the real thing. And just to prove it, they put the spear in Jesus' side. And there the blood has already separated, proving that Jesus is dead. And John knows as he records this what he's writing. And he says that I'm a witness to this. You can ask me about this. I testify it's true. Jesus is really dead. What a Friday. That was Friday. And then Sunday morning. This is John chapter 20 now. Friday mor- uh, Sunday morning. Word comes to John from Mary Magdalene. Who rushes to the back to the other disciples. And says they've taken the Lord out of the tomb. And we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple, chapter 20, verse 3, Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but John outruns Peter and reaches the tomb first. He bends over and looks at the strips of cloth lying there, but didn't go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of cloth lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who'd reached the tomb first, that's John, also went inside. So John gets there, has a peep. Peter rushes past, goes in, sees the cloth lying there, and then John goes in. And then the next line of the reading is, John saw and believed and in that moment on that Sunday morning in this empty tomb with the linen and the headcloth John sees and believes and the words that Jesus had said about being the resurrection and the life that John writes later in his gospel the words that Jesus uh, had said about being uh, bringing life in all its fullness that John records for us in his gospel in chapter 10, verse 10. Those truths tumble through John's mind. Those three times that we looked at a couple of weeks ago when Jesus says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, be betrayed into the hands of evil people, and I'll be crucified. And on the third day, I will rise from the dead. Those things come tumbling into John's mind. And there, faced with the evidence before him, it all makes sense. Jesus has been raised from the dead. He is alive. And John sees that and believes. And I trust that somewhere on your adventure with Jesus, you have come to the point where you know that this makes sense. That you know that the tomb is empty. That you know that Christianity adds up beyond all reasonable doubt because you know that the tomb is empty. And I say, if you don't know that, then investigate it. Read the Gospels, read some helpful books, find out the truth, take the position of a lawyer, work it out so that you see and believe. John himself in his Gospel later on in that chapter talks about Thomas who'd missed uh, one of the events of Jesus' um, resurrection appearances. And then John says, blessed are those who do not see and believe. Believe. People like you and I who haven't had the opportunity to arrive at the empty tomb on the morning of resurrection, who haven't seen with our eyes, but we're convinced in our minds that Jesus has been raised from the dead and we believe. And it's a mind thing, it's a brain thing, it's an intellectual thing. So on the Friday, John has this emotional encounter with the love of God that transforms him, where he receives forgiveness, where he gets a new family, where he knows that he knows that he knows that he's loved by God. And God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And here on the Sunday, he's in the empty tomb. And intellectually, he's convinced this Jesus makes sense. This is true truth. What Jesus said he was adds up. This The claims that he made for himself to be the one who will conquer death make sense. He sees and 
believes. It's a mind thing for John. But of course, it's also a heart thing. You can't believe in your mind without it affecting your heart. You can't say, yes, it's true without something happening in your heart. As you say, as your heart is strangely warmed, as happened to um, uh, Wesley. And your heart is strangely warmed and God does something in you as you believe. And, and you know that it makes sense. And your heart is changed because the love that Christ has for you begins to be reciprocated. Because he first loved you, you begin to love him. And John begins to love God with all his heart and his strength and his soul and his mind because he saw and believed. And of course it's a mind thing, it's a heart thing, but it's a commitment thing as well. You can't believe in your mind. You can't believe in your heart. You can't see these things without it making a difference to your commitment to the one in whom you have believed. Of course, John had said yes to Jesus several times before. But now there's a big yes in his heart to this Jesus in whom he has come to believe. He said yes to Jesus very uh, long ago, three years ago, when Jesus had said, come and follow me. He'd said yes to Jesus when Jesus said, come, let's go for a walk up a mountain and see who we can see up there. He'd said yes to Jesus when he'd said, go organize some people into fifties and hundreds and get them to sit down. He'd said yes to Jesus when Jesus said, here's some bread, give it to them to eat. He'd said yes to Jesus when he'd said, won't you please stay with me and, and pray with me an hour. And while he couldn't do it, in his heart somewhere, there was a desire to say yes to Jesus and now at the empty tomb he sees and believes he understands with his mind he believes in his heart and he says yes to Jesus because belief is always a commitment thing there's no going back now he believes he's in so he sees the love of God at the cross he believes in the son of God at the empty tomb And now in John chapter 20, verse 19, it says, On the evening of that first day of the week, his weekend isn't over yet, there's another another adventure with Jesus on this amazing weekend. Friday, the love of God at the cross. Sunday, believing that Jesus has been raised from the dead changing his mind, changing his heart, changing his commitments. And now on the Sunday night, it says that in the evening of that first day of the week, while the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they're not forgiven. He sees the love of God at the cross, believes in Jesus at the empty tomb. And now later in that evening, the risen Lord appears to the disciples in their upper room. They're committed to Jesus, but they're so afraid. The doors are locked, but Jesus appears and immediately puts them at their ease. Peace be with you. There's such joy in the house as Jesus shows them his hands and his side. Jesus blesses them with peace. But the primary thing that happens is that he breathes on them and they receive the Holy Spirit. I I don't quite understand how this ties in with Pentecost. It's it's always good to receive the Holy Spirit again. But here in the upper room, Jesus breathes on them and they receive the Holy Spirit. And along with the Holy Spirit, They receive peace because they're so frightened. They know God loves them. John knows that Jesus loves him enough to die for him. John knows that if he's the only one and he was the only one of the 12 in the crowd, 
that Jesus would have died for him. And he knows it's true that Jesus had been raised from the dead. It all makes sense. I believe this stuff completely, but I'm still frightened. And Jesus comes and breathes his Holy Spirit on them and says, Peace be with you. I don't know what your life's like, but maybe it is chaotic like it was in Genesis chapter 1 with the chaos of the waters and the some lives are like that, aren't they? Chaotic and the Spirit of God hovers over the water and out of that chaos comes peace and order and life and abundance and glory. He breathed on them. And they received his Holy Spirit. If you're fearful or timid or locked away, allow the Lord to blow the Spirit his Holy Spirit, into you in order that you might know peace. And then he gives them a commission. He gives them authority. He gives them a mission. It's a message, a message, message from the Lord Jesus. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Where to? doesn't matter who to don't know how just like me isn't that great as the father sent me so I send you in the same way I came to a stable outside some town backwater place as I came living in Nazareth nowhere town as I came just loving people and helping people and blessing people and caring for people, trying to meet their needs, bringing healing and forgiveness, encouraging people, lifting them up, welcoming them, including them. As the Father sent me, I'm sending you. Sending you with a message of grace and love and forgiveness, a message of inclusion and glory, a message that people can opt out of, that most people want to opt into. I'm sending you in the same way as I was sent. Receive the Holy Spirit. And if John lacked any purpose, if he lacked any direction, if he lacked any sense of being called and commissioned by Jesus, he knew. He knew from that moment when the Holy Spirit breathed onto him that he was a sent one. He was a commissioned one. He had something to say. He had something to do. He had a way of living, a way of being that looked like Jesus because he'd received the Holy Spirit. So here on this Sunday evening, John receives the Holy Spirit like he'd seen the Holy Spirit fall on Jesus three years ago in the waters when John was still following John the Baptist. What a way to end a weekend. Friday afternoon, a stunning revelation of the love of God in Christ Jesus. Sunday morning, mind and heart filled with the sense that this is true. Sunday night, filled with the Spirit of God, filled with the peace of Christ, with a message, with a model to take to the world. Where are you at with your adventure with Jesus? Let's pray that God would do one or two or three of these things for us this morning. Can we do that? Can we stand, Eli? Do you want to come and press a few keys on the keyboard, see what happens? That would be good. I love it when they do that. When I do it, it just makes a hideous din. But when you do it, it just seems to be great. Let's stand together. Father, I thank you for the, your love that is shown to us in the death of our Lord Jesus Christ at the cross. And we're sorry, Lord God, that we identify so much more with the evil people who put Jesus to death. In their vitriol and hate and envy and jealousy, in their sadism and their mockery and their 
needless violence. But we thank you that through all of that, you continued to love. Your love never fails. And we receive your love this morning, Lord Jesus. We acknowledge your love for us, that just as John was the only one of your 12 closest followers in the crowd, sometimes we feel so alone and and yet we know that we're loved by God. Pour your love into our hearts now, we pray, in the name of Jesus. God so loved you that he gave his one and only son. This is how we know what love is, that while we were still far away from God, Christ died for us. receive just receive receive the love of God allow this Lord Jesus to blow the Holy Spirit over you into you to bring his peace the peace that passes all understanding that keeps your heart and your mind the peace of Christ that we need in the midst of fearful times the peace of Christ that we need in order to be a sent one Allow him to fill you with his Holy Spirit. If you want to close your eyes and stick your hands out in front of you, that's great. Just receive, receive, receive. You can't really pray that God would show us how to believe, but we can ask him for revelation of the empty tomb, for understanding of what really went on there for wisdom to make sense of it all. We pray, Lord God, that you would help us to think through the implications of it all. But Lord, we pray too that you would warm our hearts with the truth that Christ has been raised from the dead, that that vitriol and hate and hurt, that betrayal, that agony is not the last word because Christ has been raised. We thank you that your love wins because Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. I thank you that you were pierced for our transgressions. I thank you, Lord God, that you have taken all the sting of sin and death and triumphed over it by your resurrection. Lord, as we stand before you, won't you warm our hearts with that glorious truth that we might see and believe that Jesus, God with us, has done it. So fill us, Lord, we pray. If you want someone to pray for you this morning, then please come down to the front and uh, we'll do that. We'll find someone that you know. We'll pray for you. That, That would be fine. But you can receive, you can receive revelation of the love of Father God for you. You can receive knowledge of the Holy Spirit and the peace and the commissioning that comes from Him. That you would do it like Jesus did.